Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the 32nd Fireside Great Minds, Great Lives Talks organised by the University of Buckingham. A particular welcome to those who are new to the series. Uh, you are very, very welcome indeed. And this is Martin Gayford's first talk that he's given uh, I've heard him, I'm sure many people have heard him give any number of talks. The first one he's given online, and I was just saying that already the numbers are up to some 1,200 uh, listening already, so that would be a very big haul indeed. Uh, Martin, in addition to being, uh, as we'll hear, the author of a spectacular number of, of, of remarkable books, is a very celebrated uh, journalist um, and is a wonderful friend of the university and, and is one of our research fellows. Now, if you haven't been on this series before, please ask questions. Get the questions in early if you can. Short is good. Do give us your name and you can uh, submit them via Teams. There are people on other platforms, that's harder. If you enjoy the series, do send the list out uh, of the speakers to friends, family, colleagues. The more, uh, the merrier. Um, all our speakers are talking uh, free. Uh, the whole series is free. It's just part of the University of Buckingham's uh, outreach. Uh, so there we are, Martin. Uh, let's have a look at you uh, now. As, as uh, those familiar with the series know, the great joy about doing this is that rather than the speaker coming to us, we're coming to the speaker. Uh, and Martin, here you are. Is this the room? I think this is your wife's room, uh, but tell us about it. Well, that's right. Yes, for, for complicated technical reasons, I'm talking from my wife's study at the end of our garden instead of my own study, which is in the loft of our house in Cambridge. And uh, uh, that's where I spend almost every day for uh, starting at nine o'clock in the morning writing. I think it's very, I don't know if you agree with this, uh, and I think it's very important to ha have a routine if you're a writer and I, I start every day after breakfast upstairs. And you, do you write on a machine or longhand and do you surround yourself with images of the artist you're talking about and yet another question do you carry on into the afternoon when does that when do you give up for the day well uh in order i yes i write on a laptop although i think if necessary i can write on any surface at all i remember writing on old scraps of paper on a cafe table in milan and then dictating a piece into a public telephone box uh, in the, on the pavement when those things existed and you could dictate into newspapers so i, I can write longhand uh i think the, in my case, the words appear in my mind and I, it's just a matter of transmitting them. But I'm very happy with a keyboard. I surround my, my desk is actually uh, terribly untidy, much less tidy than the stream of my wife's because it's piled up with books. Uh, lots and lots of books uh, connected with whatever my project is at the moment. And yes, I do look at lots of images and things like that all the time as well. Was there something else? And do you carry on into the afternoon? Do you have oh, a stop yeah. point? Well, I think that depends on stamina. I carry on for as long as the prose seems to be coming uh, at high quality. And I usually I usually suddenly reach a point where I feel actually I'm getting a bit tired. It's not flowing as well as it should. So if I, I, if I did carry on, it probably wouldn't be very good and I'd rewrite it the next day. Uh, in an emergency, I, I carry on doing uh, what I think I was proper writing in the afternoon. Otherwise, I use the afternoon for research and interviewing and uh, all kinds of other activities. And after you finish talking to us tonight, which artist would you most like to have dinner with? Well, as a, as a matter of fact, I've arranged to talk to David Hockney <laughs> on another sort of video <laughs> call. Okay, a, so, we can't. So, it won't we actually can't, we be. We can't uh, uh, beat that. I'm having dinner with Turner, but 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 uh, which well, slightly trumps you that, did, trumps you. Let's come straight in now to uh, the, the first of the slides. O over. Oh. 
over to, to, to you. Uh, up they come. So is that up now? We are, Martin. We can see um, the yellow house, which was, I think, 1995. Yeah, uh, 2006. Oh, sorry. 2006 it was published. And uh, is that my first, uh, well, I, I think of it as my first book. I had published other things before. It was the first book in, where, in a series in which, in my mind at any rate, I, I try to get closer to artists, both living and dead, closer to their minds, to how they work, to how they to how they thought, to their domestic circumstances. Uh, and uh, I began with uh, Van Gogh in Arles, um, partly, uh, people, I remember when I started on this, people saying, well, there's been a lot written about Van Gogh already, and why why have you chosen Van Gogh? And the answer was that uh, I, th the material was there. I thought in his case, one could get very close. And the reason was because of his peculiar circumstances. He was a very lonely person who was trapped in distant places and obliged to lead almost his entire social life on paper. And the other coincidence was that his brother Theo uh, was a, a sort of neat and tidy person who filed things. So there was a huge archive of uh, uh, Vincent's thoughts and more or less day to day. Sometimes there is, there, there, on some occasions, there's more than one letter per day. Uh, and, what, and in the little period that I, uh, I uh, investigated for the book, which is just uh, two months from uh, end of October to the end of December 1888. There was also another, uh, Van Gogh had this house guest, Gauguin, who was also writing letters. So there was an intersection. One could compare and contrast what they were saying. And uh, I found one could get a, an almost limitless amount of information about this quite distant place and time. So that while I was writing it, I I felt I was living in 1888 in France and um, Vincent didn't actually come into my dreams. The first of my subjects I started dreaming about was Michelangelo, but um, he was certainly a presence in my life for the two, three years I was writing it. Um, and uh, if we could, uh, shall we go on to the so next, next, next slide? Um, he uh, he sent this uh, image to Gauguin before the before the period I'm uh, I was I was writing about. They agreed. They decided to exchange portraits. So it was a it was a sort of anticipation of what we're all doing uh, today, which is living uh, a sort of surrogate social life via pictures. Uh, but uh, done in a very much uh, more low tech way than uh, Teams or Zoom or any of the methods we're using at the moment. Uh, uh, paint on canvas sent in, in a parcel by by train from Arles to Brittany, which is where Gauguin was. And uh, this is what, uh, this is the self image, the selfie, if you want to describe it as that, uh, which Vincent sent. He sent himself in the, utterly unguessable guise, as far as art historians are concerned, of a Japanese monk, which is the sort of thing which, uh, if he hadn't written it down, it would have been absolutely impossible for any sort of research to uh, to rediscover. He'd, be, he'd read a description of ja the behaviour of Japanese monks in a book, and he thought of himself like that, a sort of a, a humble, devoted, austere figure. Might not have been how anybody else saw him, but that was how Vincent saw himself. And uh, in, re in return, if you would have the next slide, uh, Gauguin, sent uh, himself in a very different guise, which was actually because he wrote it on the on the on the um, picture we can guess. And that was the guise of uh, the central character Jean Vengean in uh, Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Uh, and so a sort of desperate outcast from society. Again, 
possibly not how people saw uh, Gauguin at the time, a little bit more the way he's seen now, actually, because there's been a strange reversal uh, whereby while Vincent was alive, nobody, including his closest relations, wanted to have very much to do with him. He was found almost universally intolerable, his company. Uh, and almost from the moment that he died, certainly from the moment his letters started to be published, he's become one of the most universally loved figures in uh, not only in art history, in cultural history, in European history. Um, whereas while he was alive, Gauguin was a relative, not a sort of hugely popular figure in, say, the Parisian art world, but he had quite a lot of friends. People obviously weren't frightened of him, which they were of Vincent. But since he, since he died, his reputation has grown darker and darker. So that uh, uh, last year there was an exhibition of his portraits, very fine exhibition at the National Gallery. Uh, and it's the first exhibition I have ever been to in which the labels beside the pictures were critical, openly critical of the artist his, and his moral standing and his behaviour uh, have now become highly, highly uh, questionable. And uh, that was that was much discussed in reviews of the exhibition, in fact. So uh, as I say there's been a reversal. M my book was um, I thought of it at the time in literary terms as um, well, a sort of novels or uh, uh, somewhere between a detective story and the kind of um, uh, ghost stories, tale of the supernatural, which uh, actually Vincent was reading uh, Guy de Maupassant, um, uh, Edgar Allan Poe, that kind of thing. That, that was um, that was the literary diet in the Yellow House. And also they were reading about murders in the newspapers from Paris, the uh, Jack the Ripper, and there was a big case in Paris. So I, I saw this as a drama leading not exactly to a murder, but if we could have the next slide. Um, uh, a sort of terrible uh, de Blanc, de Barclo, which took place here in the Yellow House, the, the, the building of which gives the title to my to my book. Um, it's uh, a little um, fairly humble uh, southern French uh, building, which would be, I should think, if it hadn't been unfortunately demolished by U the U.S. Air Force in 1944 with a with a uh, High explosive bomb, it would be one of the most, uh, the largest tourist attractions in southern France. It would be according to Givenet. Vincent was living there on top of Gauguin. They shared the studio downstairs in a sort of pressure cooker with these two uh, very um, different and difficult in different ways uh, personalities. Um, Gauguin afterwards described uh, Vincent as an erupting volcano and he, as himself a sort of volcano as well. He was sort of quieter, but uh, also uh, had his neuroses and uh, his artistic temperament. And what happened, of course, in the end was uh, Vincent's uh, mental condition declined to the point where he committed this terrible act of self-mutilation, which um, I think uh, if we have the next uh, slide um, is, uh, well, uh, just but before we get to that, uh, it's, uh, just a reminder of some of the extraordinary number of great paintings which were produced in this uh, two month period. Uh, uh, one of the things that Vincent did was uh, personify the difference between Gauguin and himself in terms of their furniture. And it was an extremely odd and creative idea. Um, he he uh, portrayed himself as this very straightforward um, four square, uh, uh, quite utilitarian piece of Southern French um, furniture uh, in, in daylight, uh, which represented the fact that he was painting. He, he felt thought of himself as somebody who painted from life. 
in front of the subject. And uh, if we have the next one, um, Gauguin painted from, um, uh, well, sometimes from life, but also from his imagination, from his head. And one of the, um, one of the uh, uh, projects Vincent had in mind for this uh, two months of, sh uh, of living together was that Gauguin would teach him how to uh, work from his imagination, which was probably not a very good idea because if um, you know those science fiction films where there's a red lever with don't touch this lever written underneath it. I think Vincent's imagination and his memory came into that category, don't, don't open this box. And uh, uh, I, well, I think uh, working from life was probably rather therapeutic for him. Uh, opening up the Pandora's box of his imagination was a very bad idea. And uh, the result could be seen in the next slide, which uh, it was a self-portrait, uh, which the famous one in the Courtauld's gallery, which um, uh, was painted about a fortnight after this, when just about the most famous episode in the entire history of art. Uh, Vincent took a razor to his ear and uh, Gauguin was arrested at one point uh, on suspicion of having murdered him. And uh, when Vincent revived, Gauguin just got on the train to Paris and they never met again. And uh, that I felt made, gave me a plot, gave me a neat shape to this book. Uh, and into, into that drama, I tried to fold all the tensions and, and all the uh, previous and subsequent events of uh, uh, of Van Gogh's life. And uh, um, we would, uh, I actually started off by describing my different uh, job descriptions, art critic so-called and uh, um, writer of books. I've sometimes thought that talking to artists was, was my, was is actually my core activity. And um, an another artist I happened to be chatting with, uh, uh, Richard Long, the sculptor, said to me about this time, what you seem to be doing is playing about with units of time. And I think that probably was one of the things I was doing. So my, my next book uh, uh, didn't, didn't deal with uh, nine weeks. It dealt with more like seven, um, seven years in the life of John Constable. But again, it was... Um, uh, it was not a, a full biography, which is uh, something I've only attempted once, but it was a portion of a life. Um, and in this case, my model wasn't a, a 19th century uh, murder story, but uh, a Jane Austen type romance. I noticed that Constable's uh, birth date was very close. He was about two years younger than Jane Austen. His career almost paralleled hers. And it seemed to me that his extraordinarily lengthy courtship of his wife to be Mariah uh, with the very many uh, obstacles and incidents that, that, that took place um, constituted a sort of Jane Austen plot. I, I almost called this love and landscape actually, mm -hmm. rather, rather than uh, comfortable in love. And that was the, uh, Mar Mariah, who's the, the other character, she sort of plays Gauguin to um, uh, Constable's Vincent, or possibly it's the other way around. I th she was the more sensible one, actually. And to, uh, just to make uh, an obvious point here, Martin, uh, to yeah. the nearly 3,000 who are now looking at this, uh, rather than advertise beforehand which uh, where the order was the um, order in which the artists live, uh, the order that Martin's taking here is the order of his uh, books. Obvious point. <laughs> Back to you, Martin. Yes. Well, it's, 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 it's sort of the way that my I, I, I'll, I, I'll point out there are le lots of interconnections between all of them and um, uh, I, I had, as I say, a sort of drama here, which was which involved a love affair and a lot of love letters. Because another uh, 
point in common between Constable and uh, Van Gogh, which uh, somebody in a gallery might not guess, is uh, they both wrote a lot of letters and furthermore had heirs who kept them. Uh, and obviously both are crucial if you're, if you're hoping to write somebody's life. You need the evidence and you need it not to have been thrown away. So there are uh, Van Gogh and Constable are, are two of the artists of, who have multi-volume correspondences published. And Michelangelo, I'll come to in a, in a moment, is what was the third. Um, so I had love and landscape, and I also had um, uh, and that, that's as Marat we're looking at, painted by. Um, uh, Constable, and there was also there's also a sort of hidden figure in the background behind all this. Uh, a, a great enthusiast for Van Gogh, who I talked to all the, all the time I was writing the Yellow House, and also a great enthusiast for Constable, who uh, very much um, opened my eyes to the greatness of Constable as a painter, and that was Lucien Freud. Uh, so if we could go on to the uh, next slide. Um, but one, sorry, could we move on to another one? Um, that's the landscape we were just looking at over which uh, uh, John and Mariah conducted the beginnings of their, um, of their romance, by the way. Uh, so um, Lucian uh, Freud was uh, a friend for many years and we talked a lot about painting and his some of his thoughts about Van Gogh are embedded in the Yellow House. But it also occurred to me after I'd written both of them that the book I wrote next, which is called Man with the Blue Scarf, uh, was just like the Yellow House, a book about two men trapped together in a room, an artist's studio, because I, I spent, in this case, the unit of time is about 18 months. I spent about 18 months talking to Lucian while he painted my portrait and uh, he painted it uh, he painted it and also etched it. And so I got his views not only about Van Gogh and Constable, but I got them about uh, life and Picasso and his grandfather and uh, an innumerable number of other things. So uh, for this third book, I moved from uh, what might be classified as art history to what might be classified as autobiography, but it seemed to me to be actually part of the same series. And I think that having written The Yellow House was very helpful to me in uh, in structuring this book, because uh, technically, from my point of view as a writer, the problem was how do you make um, a 50,000 word book about two people sitting together in a room interesting how do, where does where's the development where's the tension and uh, i structured i structured it as a as a diary it's it's a sort of edited and um, uh, rearranged uh, version of the diary i actually kept while this th these portraits were being painted you can see there lucian at work on um the the uh oil which took from October uh, 2004 to June 2005, something like uh, uh, 160 hours of my life to paint. Perhaps we have the next slide that will give us a more of a picture. So um, while Lucian was, uh, was painting me, the idea of the book and also the truth was that I was uh, producing a mental portrait, a portrait in words of him. So he was looking at me, I was looking at him. And uh, an interesting question which occurred to me while I was sitting there and to which I don't really have a definitive answer is um, when you um, look at that picture, of me by him, do you learn more about 
him or more about me? And I suppose you could ask the same question of uh, somebody reading the book. Does it actually reveal more about me or more about Lucian or perhaps about the connection between the two of us? Is there a question, uh, Anthony? Well, I was just going to say, where is the painting? Do, do you have it? Uh, I don't it? have it, no. Um, uh, Lucian was fairly generous, but that was that was uh, worth about two million pounds as it, as it left his studio, which would have been my next, next question. Gift. I know someone would have wanted to know that two million when it left the studio, and yes. now and now quite a lot more, I would think. Uh, it's in a private collection in Northern California, but I'm told has been promised to Tate, so it may reappear in the Tate Gallery collection at some future point. And just, um, describe, just describe the the genius of that work of art. Uh, how would I describe it? Yes. Uh, uh, it's very difficult for me to get get close to it. I mean, there are um, uh, aspects of it which became apparent to me because I was there while it was being made, which might not be immediately obvious to somebody looking at even the original or uh, a photograph of it, which is that it's a sort of complicated uh, mosaic of patches of paint, which built up very slowly. Lucian's method, which was quite an unusual one, was to start the first evening he did a charcoal, rough charcoal drawing on the canvas. And the next session, he started with a splodge of paint, which was roughly in the middle of my forehead and he expanded out from that over very slowly over a period of months and so by about the following february it had got reached uh the top of my forehead maybe and sort of down towards my chin and uh, it, I, my face was made up of a patchwork of greens and beiges and greys and pinks and all very uh, often seemed rather improbable colors when he was mixing them up and putting them on all of which uh became resolved and uh, uh harmonious uh, when he finally put in the blue scarf which didn't happen until the following may i don't think That's and right. so it had somehow he'd had this chromatic harmony in his mind from the beginning but uh, and had slowly worked towards it. I was surprised and impressed by that. Um, he had the capacity which Titian in, towards the end of his life had of putting together quite surprisingly abstract mar paint marks on canvas which when you look at them um damien hurst said this to me actually another example of my sort of getting information from talking to artists that when you look closely to lucian freud there are a lot of these these little ner nervous marks and it looks almost like an abstraction then you step back a few feet and it becomes very naturalistic so uh it's got it's got that dual identity and not too many uh painters can do that i think Thank you very much. On we go. Um, uh, well, I sat uh, for, as I say, for 18 months. I also sat for an etching. There's a, there's a, uh, a less familiar image of uh, Lucian and I chatting with each other while he's, uh, he's etching on the copper plate, which he set up on his on his easel. Um, I was, while I was sitting for that, I was writing the Yellow House every morning in Cambridge before the city and running to the station, getting sort of getting into getting into costume, running to the station uh, and uh, getting to South Kensington, which is where his studio was, so, uh, by sort of time for a late lunch and then sitting. And uh, the tension of the sitting was uh, uh, again, wouldn't be apparent to anyone seeing it, that Lucin wanted to do this one by daylight. The previous painted portraits had been done by artificial light in the evening, which was quite easy for me to get to. But uh, we started this in late summer and there was plenty of afternoon light coming in, even after, after we'd had a restaurant lunch uh, through the back window of his 
studio. But as time went on, as it, uh, and the the uh, days grew shorter and shorter, uh, the, the length of the sitting got shorter and shorter until I, finally we'd only get about 40 minutes. And Lucy would say, oh, the light's gone, I, I've got to stop now. Um, I asked him to, uh, if you could turn on switch on a, a light just in the other room to just bring up the ambient lighting a bit, absolutely impossible, completely out of the question. So uh, that one took rather a long time, partly for that reason. Um, and the uh, the result was very different if you, if you move to the next slide. Uh, whereas I'm rather sort of confident and forceful in the oil painting, in the etching I look sort of, uh, I've become elongated and a bit sort of El Greco-like and, uh, and uh, neuro neurotic looking. So, uh, uh, it's it's certainly a demonstration of Van Gogh's dictum that the same person uh, will be suitable as a model for two di very different portraits, which is something I think Lucin thought as well. So um, Lucin, Constable Van Gogh were all connected in my uh, mind, and so was uh, my next, as uh, so to speak, uh, uh, artist literary partner. We we can move on to the next slide who was um, also uh, a sitter for uh, Lucian Freud and a friend of Lucian Freud, David Hockney, who had actually been preceded me in almost the same uh, format, almost the same chair uh, the year before, 2003. And um, which that was one bond between us. Uh, we, we, we produced rather different portraits. Well, his was a daylight portrait, which might might have made, be made, made a difference. I said at one point to Lucien, but I made an unfortunate remark and I said, I wondered if the, your portrait of David Hockney was, was a bit of a, a precedent for mine because it looked to, to me as if it the same sort of composition, same sort of format and so forth. And, and um, Lucian said, I, I think entirely thinking about uh, paint marks and techniques and so forth. No, I think the one I did of the of the horse's rear end uh, was was led directly into yours. Serves you, serves you right. Yeah, um, uh, could you describe the room uh, that we're looking at there? Well, this uh, that's one of Lucian's two studios and uh, his um, his uh, artist studios are all completely different and all personal. And Lucien's was, I'd say, a moderately messy one, in that he he liked, for example, to uh, clean his um, palette after he'd mixed every uh, every color mix for each stroke on the on the picture. He'd, he'd scrape it, uh, scrape the uh, what the leftovers off his. Uh, palette and whack it on the wall. So after the, after a while, the walls of his uh, studios started looking like uh, Jackson Pollock or something, a sort of gestural abstract. And he'd also he'd also leave all sorts of little notes to himself, telephone numbers, and uh, sort of cryptic remarks would be written up there. And on the floor there were. Um, rags he liked he liked to have mounds of uh, um, textiles left around which is a habit he developed in the 1960s when he was he had a studio on top of a rag and bone shop he said he found them very useful and you can see him coming in the door uh, David Dawson, his assistant, who said the photograph, who took the photograph, told me Lucian came in quite unexpectedly. He was in the process of taking, just taking a photograph of Hockney, and uh, and uh, Hockney said he's come in looking like a butcher because uh, he's wearing he's wearing this apron which he always wore to paint, which is cut was covered in paint stains, and he used to wipe his brushes on this apron. The idea of being it kept the paint off his clothes, though that he wasn't 100 percent effective there. So the studio is a very peculiarly personal room and uh, I think one can learn a lot about artists from the kind of studio they have or had. Hockney's, by the way, is much tidier. Um, and uh, 
right, so there's uh, there's a connection between uh, Hockney and Freud. And if we can move on to the next slide, my the book I published immediately after Man with the Blue Scarf was a book of conversations with Hockney, who was, in a way, Freud was a was uh, Lucid was a, a link, but actually so was Van Gogh because when I published uh, the Yellow House. Uh, a few months after, uh, David Hockney phoned me up and wanted to talk about it. And it, this was when he was living in Bridlington in East Yorkshire. And I think he found a lot of parallels between his own position and uh, and uh, Van Gogh's. One of which uh, was that he felt, and I think this is probably true, that uh, Van Gogh wouldn't have got so far so fast if he hadn't been isolated. And uh, in a way, uh, Hockney deliberately put himself into a state of isolation in East Yorkshire. I mean, not that nobody lives in East Yorkshire, but nobody from the art world lives in East Yorkshire. And uh, in fact, people from London, let alone New York or Los Angeles, found it pretty difficult to get to Bridlington. It's about a five hour train journey from King's Cross. And so he uh, found it uh, an, an easy place to concentrate. I think that was one thing. But he also became increasingly fascinated with nature and the landscape. And the book I first book, uh, book I published, um, uh, which was called A Bigger Message, was titled one of David's uh, paintings, was about essentially about this Yorkshire period and his thoughts and feelings and what he was doing then. And in this photograph we're looking at, uh, he's standing in front of the bit, one of the big paintings he did for the Royal Academy exhibition he held in 2012, which was, as far as the public was concerned, an absolutely huge success. It's one of the most heavily attended exhibitions in British history. I think somewhere over 600,000 people saw it in a rather short run. The Royal Academy didn't realise how popular it was going to be and said afterwards they would have kept it on for a couple of months if they'd known. Um, so the other th another thing he had in common with, with Van Gogh was a, a, an engagement with nature, which was an unfashionable thing in a, for an artist to do in uh, the, the 21st century, but uh, and produced a bit of a, a mixed response uh, amongst some of my uh, fellow critics, but uh, I think uh, as so often, this is one of the reasons why I like talking to artists, uh, opinions followed where they uh, followed the artist and what uh, David was doing 10 years ago doesn't look anything like as unexpected or as strange. You weren't supposed to, could we have the next one now? Uh, you weren't supposed to paint out in the landscape uh, setting up your easel like Monet or Van Gogh. That wasn't supposed to be a thing which contemporary artists did. But uh, uh, Hockney uh, said at the time um, that you know, there's always another way to do whatever the subject is. And uh, I think throughout his life, he and all really interesting artists consider that rules are simply some and fashions are simply uh, uh, to be arbitrary uh, dictates to be ignored or broken. So uh, the uh, the first book was was about his romance with the British landscape, which actually Constable is another person who who was brought to mind by that. Uh, and, and it was also the part of the point at next slide, please, at which just, he, just, where is that slide that we're just losing? That would be in the uh, walls of East Yorkshire, uh, a few miles in from Bridlington. He would drive in or drive with his assistants to uh, there was a road called World Gate, which a lot of the uh, paintings were um, done along. It's it's a it's a that looks like a very characteristic bit of rolling 
uh, Yorkshire Day, uh, Yorkshire World landscape. And why is he painting that in the segments? Uh, because uh, I think there's a technical problem about painting a huge picture outdoors, which is one of the reasons why landscape paintings historically are either oil sketches, uh, which are, you know, a foot to uh, maybe two feet across, or uh, constable six footers for exhibition at the Royal Academy, say, would, uh, which were done in the studio. Uh, I mean, it, it's a simply a practical matter. It's very difficult carrying a large canvas out into the landscape. It's liable to blow over. It, it's, uh, it's difficult to transport. And uh, uh, David's solution was to use, to, to, to assemble large pictures out of a number of smaller canvases. Marvellous. And uh, he was also at the same time experimenting with uh, uh, what were then rather new media. He got, he was a fairly early adopter of the iPhone. This is one of his iPhone drawings from 2009 we're looking at. I think marvellously beautiful thing, which, and these started appearing, popping up on one's own laptop or uh, phone um, in the morning um, on a regular basis as a sort of form of visual communication. He was keeping um, uh, in touch entirely by images. And uh, as soon as the iPad uh, appeared, uh, next slide please, he um, he moved on to that. And uh, this is, uh, I've, I've been rather, I, this is the first of a pair, it, it's the view of his desk. He was staying at Glyndebourne, uh, the uh, opera house in the country, Sussex countryside, uh, overseeing a production he designed in August 2010. This was his desk. I, uh, and uh, I think this is rather a good demonstration of what the iPad can do, which other uh, media wouldn't do quite so readily because it's actually like stained glass. It's an illuminated screen. Uh, he can turn the light on and off. Uh, next slide, please. You will see daylight completely different illumination. Um, uh, that was another uh, uh, thread running through um, the bigger message. And from that, next slide please, grew a collaboration, which, uh, we're, here we are talking again, he's moved back to Los Angeles there. That's his Los Angeles studio with the work he was doing in 2014. Um, on the wall behind. And David suggested that a bigger message was a book of conversations written by me, although quotes him extremely extensively. Um, he, uh, the next book was actually co uh, and it's David's idea. He started saying what we need is, there's been a lot of history of art, what we really need is a history of pictures. And um, by that he meant a history which uh, doesn't treat painting and drawing and photography and film and television and uh, this kind of images we're looking at now on computers as separate, but as having a continuous history and in many respects all being the same thing. They're all ways of representing the uh, three-dimensional world on a flat surface and consequently have uh, faced the same problems and the same paradoxes. And then for basically geometric reasons, uh, uh, no, no solution to that problem will ever be perfect in the same way that you can't perfectly represent a round globe on a flat map. Uh, next slide, please. This is, uh, this is the uh, cover of the history of pictures, which is also something I'm, I'm rather was rather tickled by myself. Uh, after a while, the publisher suggested a children's edition. Next slide, um, and uh, in which is very beautifully illustrated by Rose Blake, who is the artist Peter Blake's daughter, uh, who transformed David and I into children's book characters. 
<laughs> I'm the one with the blue scarf. That's my sort of uh, attribute. And uh, and uh, David's a bit more easily recognisable with his glasses. And uh, it's uh, it's a I, it's a publication I'm very uh, pleased with because I think it communicates very, partly actually because of or to a considerable extent because of Rose's beautiful work. It, it communicates very well with uh, with uh, young people in all sorts of cultures. It's transla been translated into, I think, 17, 18 different languages so far uh, and has gone all over the place. Uh, and David and I but were both very pleased by that. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, it um, discusses, as I say, uh, the continuities between uh, different kinds of picture. And uh, well, I scarcely need to identify the picture on the left. The picture on the right is Marlena Dietrich, 30s and 40s film star. And the point that David was making there is that pictures of all kinds, including paintings, have a lot to do with lighting and that both Leonardo da Vinci and the lighting specialist, specialists in the Hollywood studios were very preoccupied by the same problem. And in fact, uh, he's, he was told by some of those uh, people from the studios that, that they studied old master pictures in order to create the same effects and there you've got a very sort of soft lighting from above filtered lighting uh, producing a rather similar effect on two rather similar faces very sort of softly accentuating the cheekbones and the soft shadow under the sh under the chin um, next please Uh, a different sort of continuity. Um, uh, uh, on the left, uh, a still from the Walt Disney animated cartoon film of Pinocchio. Uh, on the right, a Japanese woodblock print by Hokusai, a 19th century work. And David's point, David, when this came out on, on VHS videotape in the 80s, David, David slowed it down so he could he could study the Walt Disney as a work of art frame by frame. And his point is that the Disney artists were rather than blowing in a completely different category from Hokusai or uh, uh, Rembrandt or Leonardo for that matter, uh, they actually were learned and uh, used all sorts of references and, the, and they were studying here a question which David actually has studied throughout his life as a, a tackle throughout his life as uh, a painter, which is how to represent water. One of his most famous pictures is called A Bigger Splash. It's a picture of uh, somebody, somebody's just jumped into a Hollywood swimming pool, but he's still uh, trying different ways of depicting trans, uh, what is actually a, a very uh, interesting uh, problem for an artist, uh, painting something which is transparent and has no, uh, no obvious volume. Um, anyway, that's the, that was the history of pictures. Uh, uh, while I was doing that, uh, starting on that, I was also painting, uh, a painting writing uh, 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 a book which preoccupied me for a very long time and I had quite a sort of uh, suitably titanic struggle with, which was a long biography of Michelangelo or Michelangelo, if you prefer the Italian pronunciation, who is, as I said, it started by saying he was the first uh, artist who actually entered my dreams. And after some years of working on this, uh, I, I had a dream in which he appeared in a rather benign mood and offered me a drink, which I took 
was a drink of the white wine, which his nephew was always sending him barrels of uh, from Florence to Rome when he was an old man. And I took it that that was a sign of his pleasure. He was a, a rather like uh, uh, Van Gogh, in fact, like a, a, a large number of creative personalities. He, he was a man who was not without his difficulties. Uh, he was uh, paranoid, uh, uh, regarded as impossible by many of his patrons. I, I felt that I'd come to understand what made him tick and also as uh, the people who are close to him tended to tended to feel that he was a likable, even lovable person in some respects. Although um, an American who'd also written about uh, uh, Michelangelo uh, warned me against making him too nice a guy, which is the which is the sort of uh, I don't know if you'd agree with this, and it's a sort of di a biographer's dilemma. I think you've got to be close to your subject, but I, I think it's dangerous to start to dislike them, or on the other hand, to start liking them too much. You've got to maintain a degree of distance. That sweet spot is yes. very hard to find. But just a quick question there, Martin: the yes. difference between um, Freud and, and Hockney uh, uh, and Van Gogh and Michelangelo not knowing them. I mean, did, did you feel that was Michelangelo or the essence of Michelangelo in your dream or was it just a conjecture of yourself? Well, Is it hard or easier not having a living figure there? Uh, it's... Um, and do letters it provide different things? different problems, I would say. Uh, Michelangelo is another person one can in principle get quite close so far as you can from words on paper get quite close because he's the third artist who's left a, a, an enormous literary archive which is because his um his nephew uh his family the buonarotti inherited all the money he'd made he was the richest artist probably who'd ever lived up to that point when he died uh and he, he has effectively elevated them into the Florentine nobility until they died out in the 19th century. They made a cult of him, which involved uh, keeping every fragment of paper connected with him, which came down to us in apple pie order. They're still in the Casa Buonarotti in Florence, most of them. Uh, five volumes of Carteggio, uh, that's about 2,000 letters to and from him. Uh, another four or five letters, uh, volumes of associated documents, contracts, uh, this and that and the other. Uh, you can get very close to, his, to him through the archive, but possibly for guessing what was going on, I would confess to challenging Lucien Freud, just to, channeling rather, Lucien Freud just a bit. Uh, and other artists I've known. I sort of felt I knew the difficulties. I mean, when when uh, Michelangelo treated a powerful patron such as Pope Julius II with something approaching contempt, cer certainly effrontery for somebody who would have been regarded in the 16th century as a servant, I could more or less hear Lucian speaking in my mind saying, uh, after all, when it comes down to it, nothing could matter to me more than one of my pictures going wrong. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, so Michelangelo would definitely have so, said here, here to that. And moving on. Um... Yes. Well, yes, we've been looking at two self images of Michelangelo, by the way. He, him, himself, he painted himself on the flayed skin of St Bartholomew uh, held up in the middle of the Last Judgment, the last image, and as Nicodemus holding up the dead Christ carved in marble in a deposition he painted, he carved for his own tomb, uh, which is now in, the, in a museum in Florence. Uh, so rather two different, rather different images. I've put in there the title page of Vasari's Lives of the Artists, uh, which is yet another source for me to, uh, but also because um, I feel something I've come to feel is I, I belong to a bit of a tradition of uh, writers who write about art, but also talk to artists. 
And I think in many ways that goes back to Vasari, but it goes back to the 16th century. I, again, that poses certain problems. How close do you get? How much distance do you maintain? But it seems to me to be the only way to get the best evidence, the best information. Um, and that led me on to uh, three dimensional art. Uh, here, obviously, this is Michelangelo's Pieta. I hadn't, until Michelangelo, I hadn't written a huge amount about sculpture and architecture, uh, but uh, Michelangelo led me directly to my last final project. I wonder if, Anthony, how much time have we got? Perhaps we should just well, get I'm to going the to make a, 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 I'm going to extend this by five minutes if people can, of course, you can always drop off. But if we finish at, at five past seven, it will just allow a few uh, time for a few questions. Well, so, so it, if we could move to the very last slide, I'll just make this link with Michelangelo. Uh, it's if you move, we move on past. This is oh, a, that's too interesting. That's too OK. Interesting. All right. Well, I'd, I'll very quickly. I mean, this is a book where, where I was going to exclude, but perhaps I shouldn't. Modernists and Mavericks, uh, if, my, if my other books were sort of duets mm. between two artists, myself and an artist, this I thought of as a choral work. It's got actually dozens of artists in it. Uh, Lucian and David Hockney are two of them, Francis Bacon. But it also mentions uh, one of my prime informants was another great friend of mine who uh, sadly died about the, just about the time it was published in 2018, Julian Ayres. This is a photograph of Julian in 1948, and it rather beautifully makes the point of how few female art students there were uh, all those years ago, 70 or plus years ago. There's uh, yeah. very glamorous 16 year old uh, Julian sitting at a pub in South London with a lot of male art students. Uh, I think there's one other female woman art student in the background, but it's, it was mainly a male world. And Julian, if we could move on, became one of the leading uh, abstract painters, British abstract painters of the 50s and 60s. There she is about 20 years on in the early 60s, looking very glamorous mm -hmm. again. Um, and Riley, next. And, um, Modernist Mavericks is quite a diverse uh, book with uh, different kinds of artists in it. Uh, Bridget Riley is another of my informants and another of the major figures in it. And also, uh, one last slide, Frank Bowling, who uh, an artist who I've been talking to for at least 30 years now, uh, who started his career in Guyana, though he's been living in London since 1953, and had a, I thought, triumphant show at Tate Britain last year. That's the next slide. There's, there's Frank in the 60s. And um, yes, this is the book which hasn't come out yet and which sort of came out of in my mind from the Michelangelo book is a book all about sculpture, three dimensional art, co written with a great living sculptor, Anthony Gormley. And Michelangelo again comes, comes into it a lot, as does Anthony and very, very many other uh, cultures and artists. We, uh, Anthony, as Anthony's insistence, we've actually uh, not only included. Uh, art from the, la uh, the last uh, 40 or 50,000 years of human production and from uh, throughout the, every culture in the world, really. Uh, we've also introduced one or two works by uh, pre-human ancestors, uh, Neanderthals and um, Homo erectus. We're going to have just four quick questions we will finish at five past first time we've ever gone over the seven o'clock yes. on this series uh question uh why art why why do human beings create art why don't animals um well uh the well i'm sort of half um 
answer to, enter to, on an uh, answer there that it, it it looks as if at least our pre-human ancestors were sort of pre-artists if not if not full artists uh, homo erectus one and a half million years ago was creating axe heads which go a lot well well beyond the practical yeah. uh, I'm not sure that it is an, an absolutely exclusively uh, human impulse, but I'll give you one other answer, which is David Hockney's one, which is that uh, people love pictures and a lot of people like looking at pictures more than they, they like reading words, which is something <laughs> for the authors to think about. That, that goes down. It's tough in a university to hear that. Hong Po says, uh, what is it about Bangkok? Why are they so fascinating? Is there a Bangkok today? Um, is there one living today? Well, if there were, I suppose, X hypothesis, we wouldn't know about him because he'd be or she would be working away in obscurity somewhere. Don't, Van Gogh didn't. Uh, well, he was just be, beginning to emerge in the months before he died. Um, I would like to think that there is a, an artist as great as Van Gogh coming along. I think there are great painters alive. I think there are several great painters alive actually now. Um, what's so fast? The next question, which yeah. painting of those artists would you most like to have? Uh, of all of those artists? Mm. Gosh. Um, That's Katie. Wow. Uh, and Mark I, says, do you own any famous artwork? Uh, well, I own I own some work, some artworks. I wouldn't say they're necessarily famous. I I do own, for example, a copy of the uh, um, etching that uh, Lucian did of me, right? although not of the painting. Um, I'm still deliberating on that. Uh, which, uh, if I can have any of them, and I'm rather tempted to say I'd like the Sistine Chapel ceiling, but uh, fitting it into our uh, house in Cambridge would be quite tricky. And John says, what do you think of Banksy? Is he a great artist? Uh, I'm not sure I think he's a great artist. I think he's a very clever or, and uh, imaginative uh, person. And uh, uh, I certainly wouldn't write him off. Whether his work has the lasting qualities, I think probably great art has to pass the 50 year test, if not the 100 year test. So it's quite difficult to tell at the time moment it's being created and sarah wants to know uh if you were a painter which which who would you be most like now i think i'd probably be more of uh probably more of a hockney than a freud i'm i, I would probably more uh, van gogh and hockney are fast operator i when i paint when i have painted in the past i worked quite fast lucian worked was right at the other end of the scale, tremendously slow. <laughs> That's what we observe. Uh, and uh, just the final question, really final question, is the chair, which you showed at the very beginning, how long might that have taken Van Gogh to have painted that chair with a pipe on it? Um, well, uh, according to the letters, somewhere between a day and two days. He, he was he was a, uh, he was going in a way uh, dangerously fast. He was able to turn out more than one uh, masterpiece a day uh, towards the end of his life. There we must finish. We have coming up and please you're so welcome to join these uh, talks. We have Rachel Kelly talking about mental health on Friday, John Brown tomorrow, Rory Stewart next week, Greg Doran, the artistic director of the Royal Shakespeare Company, Bryony Gordon again on mental health uh, next week. Do pass these on to your friends. Do find out more about the history of art at the University uh, of Buckingham. Do go out to art galleries when you can. Uh, but above all, from all of us, uh, Martin, you have such a wonderfully engaging way of talking and bringing the artists and the artwork uh, to life. It, it's a real uh, thrill um, uh, to, to, to have uh, to, to have you on um, and we are going to give you a gift the University of Buckingham we're going to give you uh, money no object my successor here is going to find the money for you we're going to buy you any painting or sculpture in the, in the world that you would love to have in your house if it would fit in what are you going to go for Oh, I, I'm, you're asking me again. Oh, yeah, oh. again, what are you now going to go? This is real. 
what, what, uh, one work of art. OK, I'll, I'll have the Van Gogh self-portrait we started off with, uh, self-portrait as a Japanese monk. Very good. Excellent. Martin Gayford, great, great pleasure. Well, thank, you. Thank, well, you. thank you. It's been a great pleasure and thank you for inviting me. Huge fun. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye, bye. everybody.